first is going to be the peer-reviewed literature. Now I'm going to read you some passages from a review of the management of antidepressant discontinuation syndromes. This is a pretty good study, actually. It came out in 2015 by Emma Wilson and Malcolm Ladder. Let's see where they're from. King's College London. King's College London. I wonder if they have any uh, conflicts of interest. <laughs> Probably. Most of them do with these studies. Com they, they just so happen to consult with Eli Lilly or Glaxo Klein Smith or Johnson & Johnson or any of these other ridiculously profitable evil corporations. So anyway, let's get into it. So this study basically reviews the literature on antidepressant withdrawal. So it takes all the studies that have been published and then takes the, the main information from them and kind of prevents pr provides like a review of the literature, so, sort of like a textbook would do. Any textbook you have is basically a review of the literature of that subject. It takes all, takes all the peer-reviewed literature, analyzes it all, and then determines what the general take-home messages and and from these uh, from this literature. So let's get into the more uh, important details. I'm just going to review some of the highlighted parts of the study so that you guys can learn a little bit about this. Maybe maybe uh, not everyone has access to these articles. So in the abstract. I highlighted one part, and then I'm going to go into the intro. Strong evidence supports the existence of a discontinuation syndrome following withdrawal of an antidepressant medication, particularly second-generation antidepressants. That's the SSRIs as opposed to the tri tricyclic antidepressants or the monooxidase inhibitors, M and the MAOIs, or MOAIs. The syndrome is a common phenomenon, and guidance is best to avoid the symptoms. Is, and and guidance as best to avoid the symptoms is essential for both practitioners and patients. No shit. Let's get into the details here. So I'm going to skip over some of the. Let's see here. Okay, this just goes over how common this is and some of the background. I'm going to get right into the details. Okay, so here in the introduction section, despite having a superior side effect profile. <laughs> really? Second, <laughs> that's such bullshit. Second generation antidepressants have been reported to be associated with discontinuation syndrome upon withdrawal. Well, so did the original ones, guys. A discontinuation syndrome can present a number of challenges, not only due to the unpleasant side effects experienced by the patient, but in addition, the emergence of such symptoms may be mistaken for a relapse of the underlying condition. A, cycle, uh, a, f a physical disorder is a possible side effects in new antidepressant if a switch is made during treatment. This is very common. People stop these drugs and they do experience a quote, they may think it's a relapse, but in fact it's actually a withdrawal effect. A particular concern is expectant mothers. Well, yeah, let's, let's read more about that. Cohen and colleagues found that 68% of the women who discontinued antidepressant treatment proximate to conception, that is, around when birth occurs real oh no I'm, so I'm sorry around when uh when you're fertilized so after you know after you have sex when you first learn that you're pregnant they relapse during pregnancy in terms of depression of these approximately 50 percent relapse within the first trimester 90 percent by the end of the second and 60 who discontinued antidepressant treatment in the study at the beginning of pregnancy reintroduced the antidepressant therapy <laughs> There's just so much wrong with that information right there. I can't even be... So what this is saying is that, yes, it is common for expectant mothers to be taking these toxic drugs. And not only that, but they can't get off of them during pregnancy. They try, but then their depression comes back, or actually it's the withdrawal, and they have to get back on the drugs and actually conceive, um, not and actually give birth to these babies that have been influenced by these drugs. Another concern is the neonate. As a discontinuation symptom has also been detected in small percentage of infants. Now, when you when you when they say a small percentage, you know they are pushing that number under the rug. I'm sure it's much much higher than that. Just like any drug, just like someone a mother who's ingesting alcohol or crack cocaine or heroin, there's it's going to be in the infant. Come on, people, don't be so naive. In a small percentage of infants exposed to them in utero, that means while the while the baby's forming, the mother's taking it particularly with the SSRI exposure. All antidepressants, this is an important point to remember, all antidepressants cross the placenta, and therefore all antidepressants potentially carry some risk of a discontinuation symptom in exposed neonates. And I would like to also add, there's a strong possibility that a lot of these infants are going to be 
affected in terms of their development. Because as Dr. Healy stated in one of my earlier videos, these drugs potentially damage the C fibers, which are responsible for essentially all uh, all tactile sensations throughout the body, and they also potentially damage the brain. So what, in, what influence do these nerve and brain damaging and potentially uh, addicting medications have on a growing infant whose cells continue to replicate in utero for many, many months? Well, I'll let you be the judge, but just take a look at some of the other drugs. What, do you, what effect does ecstasy have on expecting mothers? It's probably not good, considering that ecstasy and SSRIs both increase the, le increase the levels of uh, synaptic serotonin. The effects may be similar, but of course, there's no studies on that because Big Pharma doesn't want to lose their money. And I, I'll continue. The elderly are another group which require specific guidance about antidepressant treatment and discontinuation, as depression is the most common mental health disorder affecting this age group, and yet most research is conducted on younger populations. So we're giving these drugs to older people, and there's never been really any studies looking at how these drugs affect the geriatric population. It's pretty pretty responsible, guys, doctors. It's good, good dude. Let's, let's poison our elderly, damage their brains and their peripheral nervous systems so they can't pass on wisdom to the younger generation that's brilliant i mean if there was someone who was trying to learn about western society and they were reading this study they'd be appalled at some of this information that's this reported so candidly in the study and i continue they suggest that ssri discontinuation symptoms may arise from the rapid decrease in serotonin 5-ht and those are the types of neurons that transmit uh serotonin the 5-HT availability when treatment ends abruptly, but also note that discontinuation syndrome may not be mediated exclusively through 5-HT. Oh, really? So there's more effects, not just on serotonin, but these drugs affect what else? They propose that noradrenaline, and that is norepinephrine, basically, which, bas it, which is a, c a critical neurotransmitter, not only in the brain, but also in the peripheral and autonomic nervous systems, and the cholinergic systems. Oh, that's acetylcholine, which is a massive... It would, which is a massively important neurotransmitter for the parasympathetic nerv nervous system. Oh, gee, that's great. So not only is my brain being affected with serotonin, but these drugs are also affecting potentially the autonomic nervous system, which controls your heart, your gut, your everything, your, the way that your eyes function. And not only that, but it's also affecting your the parasympathetic and uh, basically the fight and flight response, the response you get when there's a, a threat or affected by these drugs. It's great. Well, at least at least these guys are reporting it and i continue common phenomenon amongst a wide range of antidepressants include t tri tricyclic antidepressants mono mono uh what is it monoamine oxidase inhibitors and ssris particularly with the more potent and shorting acting ssris such as paxil and effexor so this is basically what that basically said is that these withdrawal symptoms are most pronounced in these drugs that are more powerful, more potent. They have more of an effect on acetylcholine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. But not only that, but they also have very short half-lives. Studies have shown that this withdrawal reaction is a genuine syndrome experienced by at least some of the patients and therefore does present a clinical concern. Now let's go into the uh, results here. Two of the articles, now this is basically them talking about the, the articles that they read. Two of the articles suggest that reducing the dosage by 25% per week is sufficient. So now they're going to talk about some of the recommendations in the literature. 25% per week is sufficient. That's quite rapid. 25% per week, that means within a relatively, like within a month or so, you're going to be off the drugs almost completely. However, there's other studies that show that three months is necessary for uh, for in order for your serotonin, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine levels to return back to normal. Three months is a big difference by 25% per week. And there's others that recommend four months of withdrawal. So for those who think that these drugs are safe and not addictive, why then would you have to... I mean, when you go on osteoporosis, let's say uh, any, medic any other medications, really, do you have to taper over a long period of time? Or does the doctor usually just say, you just stop taking it, let's switch to another one? So usually they they just stop they make you stop taking they switch to another one they're playing they're they're these are all chemistry experiments with your brain and your child's brain and your family's brain rare I mean a lot of times doctors just tell you to get off them rather quickly I'm gonna tell you later what the what the uh, the the uh, anecdotal recommendations are but generally the literature here this is the literature it's saying that you should 
it no really no more than three months it should take you to get off these drugs which is a long time that's a long time does the doctor tell you oh yeah I know you might take this drug for a couple months, but then you're going to have to continue to take it for another four months afterwards just to get off because it's such a dangerous drug and affects your brain so profoundly. They don't tell you that, do they? Tapering schedules. Let's read some more. Most articles review agree that tapering is unnecessary for patients who have been taking an antidepressant for four weeks or less, as this is insufficient time to develop a withdrawal reaction. Well, that's debatable, but that's what the literature says. Four weeks or less. So if you take these drugs for more than four weeks, you have to spend four months to get off of them. So you're on them for a month, and then just to get off of them without suffering from quote-unquote withdrawal, you have to spend four times that amount of time just to get off of them. And that's the literature. That's not even, this is like the published stuff. So you know it's actually much different than that. Two of the reviewed publications suggest that the half-life of the drugs plays a more pivotal role than the taper rate. This is this makes sense. They also suggest that for antidepressants with a shorter half-life, such as Effexor and Paxil, the more a more gradual dose reduction would be advisable. Oh wow, so you mean four months isn't enough to get off these drugs. Maybe you have to spend a year tapering off these drugs. Really? I wonder if the doctor told you that. Let's continue. A distinction was made between Pax, uh, Prozac and other antidepressants due to its relatively long half-life. So as I mentioned in my other video, a lot of these drugs have half-lives that are very short. Most of the antidepressants are, that are available do not last in your body for more than a couple of days. The one drug, like as soon as you take the drug, it's basically halfway gone within a day, and then another day, there's another half of that, and, then, and it continues. That's basically the half-life, how long it takes for half of the drug's dose to disappear from your bloodstream, and, theref and, that, and therefore, when it disappears from your bloodstream, it doesn't affect your brain anymore. So... The only drug out of all of these that has a half-life that's somewhat responsible is Prozac, which is around three months, and I've had a doctor tell me it was six months. So this article is hitting on a lot of really important things. If you read these, I mean, this is a lot of this is a pretty good article, actually. A lot of these articles don't even talk about this stuff. So let's continue. Sorry for the uh, tangents, but I, this, I feel like I should add my opinion when I go to things. So now this is in the discussion. Oh, no, this is still in the result. <laughs> anyway, let me continue. I highlighted all the important parts. So, in addition, these two authors found that those patients who had experienced adverse symptoms during the early phases of treatment, this is very important, folks, listen to this. If they have experienced adverse symptoms during the early phases of the treatment, they're more likely to suffer from a discontinuation syndrome upon withdrawal and therefore should be monitored closely during discontinuation. They emphasize a gradual dose reduction cannot guarantee to obviate a discontinuation syndrome so that some patients may still prefer to discontinue abruptly. So what they're saying is that if you have startup side effects, like I did when I started taking Effexor, I had really bad startup side effects. I don't know if it's just a coincidence, but according to this research here, you may have worse withdrawals, and that certainly was the case with me. I would suggest, and this isn't medical advice, if you have startup symptoms from these antidepressants, get the hell off them. If you start to have tingling and numbness, your eyes start to behave funny ways. You have uh, digestive problems, headaches. Get the hell off them. Your body is not happy. Because this, this statement just said that if you have those symptoms, you're going to have a hard time getting off. So that means you're going to spend four plus months just trying to get off the drug. And all that effort may not even prove beneficial because they say that it cannot obviate a discontinuation syndrome. So even if you quit cold turkey, they say, you may still have the same symptoms as if you were to taper. What kind of drugs are these, what kind of, what, what kind of effects do these drugs have on people? If you can't even, there's no strategy here that guarantees the obviation. Let's go into the discussion now. Dis and this is kind of like a summary. Despite a plethora of research detailing the existence and manifestation of a discontinuation syndrome following antidepressant withdrawal, the comprehensive literature identified only 18 articles, 18 articles out of thousands of articles ever published focus on antidepressant withdrawal which provide explicit guidelines on how to best to discontinue antidepressant medications in order to avoid unnecessary side effects so out of thousands of articles since the early, since these drugs have been produced this review only found 18 which is like 0.05% of all studies focusing on withdrawal oh my god i mean Really? I'll keep, I continue. As well as there being a lack of guidance in general, 
The available literature comes with its own limitations, putting into question whether or not the advice available is even reliable. For instance, some of the articles reviewed in the current study only of all 18, only five are clinical studies. So out of the thousands of studies that have ever been published on these drugs, only five are clinical studies that focus on withdrawal. I continue. At present, the most recent antidepressant guidelines advise this method and recommend a minimum period of a four-week taper following long-term treatment. That is, long-term treatment is defined as longer than a month, which is not really long-term treatment. Preferably over months for a planned withdrawal of antidepressants. So they, they, they recommend months, not just four. Four weeks is minimal. You really want months. However, as highlighted, some debate remains as to the optimum taper schedule. Yeah, no shit. Currently, a number of websites such as WebMD and Harvard Health offer advice to patients considering or presently undergoing drug withdrawal. I'm going to go over those websites next because it's laughable. And this study, peer-reviewed, highlights that. But information, it, it continues, but information is general and at times contradictory. The, for example, while, well, while WebMD quotes that the National Institute of Health in, in saying that antidepressants are not habit-forming, are really NIH. The, the charity mind advises that some drugs do have the potential to be addictive, as some are used as street drugs. Really, no shit. Why would these drugs not cause addiction if they're very similar to street drugs like ecstasy and are actually used by addicts to, to cope with their inability to get illegal drugs? Hmm. And we're giving these to our pregnant mothers and our children and our elderly? That's a good idea, guys. Let's continue. As mentioned previously, specific guidelines also need to be made available for cases in which there is particular concern such as pregnancy and treatment of the elderly. And I would add children. Don't you think that's kind of important? If you're going to give these children these drugs, don't you want to maybe have a different set of guidelines for people that have much higher metabolism than these elderly patients or pregnant mothers? That might be important, uh, Big Pharma. Maybe you should look into that. Once I continue, one study found some tentative evidence for a dose effect for antidepressants and the risk of neonatal discontinuation syndromes. This suggests that the dose rather than the drug half-life and placental passage may be more critical in determining risk. So what that passage basically says is that it's basically saying without saying it, these drugs definitely affect the fetus. And if you're a pregnant mother taking these drugs, you better be on alert because there may be some very profound side effects. I continue. It may also be beneficial to seek alternative treatment for depression in such cases, <laughs> or even for those patients experiencing mild forms of the dis disorder before considering medication due to the issues it can create during discontinuation. What a that's I can't add anything to that. Don't take drugs as the first line of defense, people. If if you <laughs> why are you giving pregnant mothers and children and people if there's other alternative, more effective ways to treat these uh, conditions? Exercise has been proven to be just as, if not more, effective than antidepressants. And there's also been studies that show that placebos are just as effective than antidepressants without any side effects. I mean, really. I mean, I'm speaking to the quiet. I'm actually not speaking to anybody because my channel has like what one subscriber. So, by the time someone actually finds this channel, it's gonna be uh, <laughs> maybe a long time. Anyway, I'm talking basically talking to myself. I'm gonna continue though. That being said, tapering can also be fac facilitated by liquid. Okay, so kind of going over some some, oh, some ways to help you taper from these poisonous drugs. Tapering can also be facilitated by liquid formulations for the precision in very gradual dose re reductions. While tapering strips are now also available for some antidepressants, including Paxil, in which each strip contains a lower dose in each consecutive day. Again, these drugs are nasty drugs. If you have to take strips and put them on your skin just like the nicotine patch, I mean, are the doctors really telling you about this? Or do you have to get a specific... In order to get off these drugs safely, they're suggesting that you may have to get specific... Uh, sorry, I just had a brain fart there. Specific prescriptions for the liquid version so you can ease more easily separate it because I don't know if anyone here has ever tried bead counting which is basically opening the drug and taking it out but it's absolutely miserable in order to do that effectively you need to buy a jeweler's scale in order to accurately measure it so that's basically the more the more important points of that study I hope that was interesting and informative <laughs>